There, so we're gonna have a talk about cryptography. Uh, specifically, I'm gonna show some examples in Python using Python's, uh, the closest thing Python has to a standard crypto library. Um, so the slides are all just very general and agnostic, and then the examples that we get into are, are gonna be Python specific. So learning about cryptography is, for me, a lot like learning about airplanes. You're like you have wing aerodynamics, you've got your control panel that does everything, you've got air traffic control, booking a flight, you can manufacture airplanes. There's a lot to know about airplanes. Um, and I'm gonna assume right now, you don't even know what an airplane does or what it looks like or why you would want one. You've heard a lot about airplanes um, and people are like, yeah, if you get really into airplanes, then you can get some board ape NFTs or whatever. Um, uh, but so I'm gonna explain to you what, by the way, crypto, Currency and blockchain is a very adjacent topic that uses these concepts, but is its own thing. Um, but so we're gonna talk about what the basics of cryptography look like. <clears throat> so you know, the cast of cryptography, you've got hash functions, you've got random number generators. Those are things that you probably know about. You've probably used a hash function at some point that just takes an input of some unbounded size and turns it into a digest. Um, uh, so there are two different kinds of encryption here. We have symmetric encryption, and then below that we have asymmetric encryption. We'll talk about both of those. Uh, there's also something you maybe have never heard of called a message authentication code, MAC, which is also very important, uh, which, is, which gets a lot less press. Um, and we'll also talk about signatures, which is like the mirror image of asymmetric encryption. Um, and I'll touch on uh, homomorphic encryption at the end because I think it's a very cool concept that is really finally starting to take off and will probably be pretty huge in 10 years, at least in certain domains. All right, so when we talk about crypto, we talk about Alice and Bob. We have all of these different actors. Uh, so you say like Alice and Bob are trying to have a conversation, uh, but there's an eavesdropper, Eve, who can listen to their messages, or possibly there's Mallory who can change their messages. And we talk about how efficacious different techniques are to deal with, detect, uh, avoid these two different kinds of attacks, an eavesdropping attack or, or a you know, kind of mutation. So the two objectives of cryptography are directly correspondent to these two different kinds of things, uh, are confidentiality, which is no one can read my messages, and integrity, no one can alter my messages, or at least no one can alter my messages without me knowing about it. So first off, talk about hash functions. We're gonna, we're gonna use hash functions in a much more interesting way uh, when we get to signatures. Uh, but hash functions, like, uh, you know, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-256, et cetera. Um, they're deterministic. You give it the same input, it gives you the same output. Uh, they're not reversible because they are inherently lossy because there's an infinite number of inputs that correspond to a finite number of outputs. Okay, I won't, I won't show you an example of that because I assume everybody has, has done a hash function before. Um, I'll talk very briefly about random number generators, but random number generators, how you get random numbers that an adversary cannot predict, uh, that is critical because if an adversary knows what your numbers are, then it's just game over. They're like, we know what your secrets were. We know how you mutated this exactly because we know what numbers you started with. Um, I promise no math, I accidentally put some math in here. But as you can see, random number generators are not magic, it's just like you just do some very convoluted stuff and then you get another number and then you feed that number back into the number generator and it gives you a number that's very different from the number you just put in in ways that are very difficult to predict or reverse engineer. Um, but you can also, so how you start this process depends on your seed. So if, the, if your adversary can guess your seed value, then they can know all of the other values that you got out of it, um, which is why you use things like uh, entropy sources, like what you're doing on the computer, mouse movements, things that are kind of chaotic. Um, there are also ways to use cosmic rays to uh, seed your random number generator. There actually are USB dongles you can get to plug into your computer that will just detect cosmic rays and it's very hard to detect the frequency of cosmic rays in any particular, co in any particular time interval. Um, so it's a pretty good source of random noise. 
you know, if your adversary can detect how frequently cosmic rays are hitting your USB dongle, then you're probably, you're probably in big trouble anyway. <laughs> All right, so we're getting to the first, first real uh, interesting application of cryptography. So is symmetric encryption. Um, so as you've probably heard, encryption can encrypt and decrypt. So you encrypt plain text to produce ciphertext, and you decrypt ciphertext to produce the plain text. Um, and you use a key. All, all operations that I'm gonna go talk about from here on out have keys. Um, the other things I talked about did not have keys. Uh, hash function doesn't have keys. Um, so I'm gonna use this notation here. The encrypt operation takes as its operands a plain text and a key and produces ciphertext. Decrypt takes ciphertext and key and produces plain text. Every cipher suite can, uh, supports, every symmetric cipher suite supports these two operations in some form or another. Um, so you and your partner have to share a key. So here I'm gonna jump over to, uh, um, what was it called? I'm gonna just drop out of this. Okay, so to show cryptography, uh, PyCA, Cryptography is the package we're using. If you just type import cryptography in pip, this is what you will get. Um, but they, they're very careful to prefix it because, I mean, cryptography is just a word. And if you're like Python cryptography, you're, you might be talking about the package, you might not. So they call the package PyCA cryptography, but what you actually type in is import cryptography. Um, so how this is structured. So the first recipe right here is a symmetric encryption recipe. So they have two different uh, libraries for recipe support, and then everything else is called the hazardous materials layer. Um, it is designed so that if you are using the recipes layer, it is nigh impossible to do something that is a bad idea. Like they don't give you configuration options that you can shoot yourself in the foot with. Like this is, this gun is mounted in position and can, you can't point it at your feet. Um, <laughs> uh, everything else is, yeah, you can give it bad operands in a way that would, you know, put the, the integrity of what you're doing at risk. So does the recipes layer build with the primitives, I assume? It's yes. Like it's composing those things in a yes. happy path? Yep, you? exactly. That's exactly right. So yeah, as you can see, it's, so they have this thing called Fernet, which is something I've never heard of before, but that's what they call it. They call this, this recipe is called Fernet. Um, there's a lot of different uh, primitives. Actually, Fernet, is this like, I'm curious what will come up if I just Google this real quick. Is it like a drink or something? <laughs> Maybe, uh, I'm not. I am not able to load this, so I don't know what's going on with the internet. Um, but I've got this here. So first, you generate a key. This is why you need a random number generator. You're going to need your random number generator. So first, we import Fernet, um, and we generate a key. So here, I have a key here. Key. And this is actually just a, a byte string. And then to go back here, we create like a Fernet object based on this key. Okay, so F is this Fernet object. And the Fernet object supports encrypt and decrypt options. And as you can see, we can just pass in this byte string. Oops. And we get a much larger um, token here that is probably because uh, it's, it's much larger probably because it also includes um, authentication in it as well, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but so that way, if somebody just messes with your stuff, uh, you will know about it. It will also, it will try and decrypt, because if, if you were just using encryption and they scrambled it around, you could decrypt it, and it probably wouldn't decrypt anything meaningful, but it would probably just be a bunch of bunch of gobbledygook, but you wouldn't know for sure if your partner just sent you some gobbledygook or if uh, somebody messed with it. But if you have, if you have uh, an authentication layer, which we'll get to, 
uh, you can know that no, this is this this doesn't match. So you so Fernet like this is what it does. You're just like get me an encrypted form of this using a symmetric key, and then your partner will do exactly what you just did and say f equals Fernet key, and then they will say f dot uh, decrypt the token, and it will turn it back into plain text. So token is a ciphertext in this example. Yes. So they call it a token because it's more than a ciphertext. It, it encodes some other information as well about, okay. about uh, integrity. But so yeah, actually, if we, if we just want to do encryption, I can pull up um, a symmetric encryption. Like I'm sure I can get AES in here. Um, algorithms, AES256. That's my jam. OK. So we can just go over here and say from crypto hazmat primitives cipher algorithms import AES256. It is called 256 because it uses a 256 byte or bit keys. OK. And how do I generate a key? OK, there we go. Oh, I need to like import. Oh, so you need to do a lot of stuff yourself. Um, so for example, here we are saying, hey, get me uh, you know, 32 random bits or bytes. I don't actually know the random. It's probably, it's, it must be bytes. Uh, so I'm getting 32 random bytes. I'm getting 16 random bytes here. And actually, as you can see, this example they have here is in fact doing something a little bit wrong, I assume, because um, I'm, I'm very suspicious that I'm seeing you random here. Or is that? I don't actually know. I'm very curious. Oh, it is suitable for, for computer views. So you could mess it up. And is there an OS dot random? Yes. So, so you random, I'm sorry, is the is apparently the good one. Um, random, if you use it OSI random, it is not on label suitable for cryptographic applications. It is kind of just eh, it's random enough. Looks looks pretty random. Um, you random actually uses the entropy pool. It's actually possible to drain your entropy pool if you don't do anything on your computer and you keep asking it for, for entropy. It's like, well, I haven't seen anything that wasn't the, my deterministic computer universe. Um, and you can run out of entropy. Andrew, are you going to talk about the secrets module at all in this talk? I'm just curious. Um, so I'm curious if the. Oh, I, I am not. Uh, the secrets module is like an alias for you random. I don't, I don't remember what all is in there. I what it what out. is. Python secrets module. I was not, but oh, generate secure random numbers. OK. But I don't remember if the numbers that came out of there are just a, a nice fancy alias for you random, or if Let me see. So they say it's suitable for generating secure random numbers. OK. Um, oh, it's just it just has a really, really nice API. Yeah, it probably, it probably uses you random. So once upon a time in Python, this used to be hard. <laughs> yeah. There was no clear guidance. And then the secrets module came out in 3.6, I guess, um, and was a useful interface that people could then rely on uh, as like to get real entropy and all the kind of stuff that you care about. But I don't remember you random. So I'm kind of trying to like piece it all together in my head. Yes. Like this is, this. sorry, this naming is surprising to me um, because in Unix, um, U random, I believe, is not is not suitable. The the slash dev slash random. Yeah. 
to have urandom, which reuses to produce more pseudorandom bits. That means it will not block, but the output will contain less entropy. So urandom is, is less good than random for cryptographic purposes. Um, and that's, that's just, I'm just talking about the Unix, the Unix file handle here. Like if you have ever, if you just go into a Unix system, which I'm not logged into right now, um, and type like cat slash dev slash urandom, you will, it will just start spitting out a bunch of characters at you. <clears throat> All right. So anyway, that is, that is a great example of a way that you can do things in a more or less secure way that is very difficult for you as a human to know, hey, how random are these, are these bytes? Andrew, going back to your code example, mm -hmm. I was wondering yeah. if you were to slice off part of the token. Oh, yeah. So like just trim oh, great question. Just a couple characters, I'd be curious to see. They would probably that. hate that. Yeah. Like... So telling me, kind of it says, yeah. yeah, so it, Im it immediately told me signature did not match digest. So it's telling me that is, in fact, the integrity, which we'll get to in a minute, um, saying, yeah, the, the integrity check on this failed. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, the secret module really just seems like it produces some secure stuff in a really great way. This looks awesome. I did not know about this. Thank you. Yeah. So... Yeah, you can just say like, get me an integer with k random bits, or get me a random int um, between zero and an n exclusive. Nice, or random, or choose an element at at random in a cryptographically secure way. Cool. All right, so this was our first uh, our our first symmetric crypto. Um, as I've been alluding to. We're also gonna now talk about, oh, so I'll talk real quick about old-timey symmetric encryption. So before we had computers, we had, we had cryptography. It just wasn't good. And uh, so like Caesar cipher is, you, you may have done this, you know, as a seven-year-old or whatever, where you like rotate things down the alphabet. Um, ROT 13 is technically, an, a is a Caesar cipher keyed to 13. Um, uh, a Playfair cipher is a little bit more complicated. Basically, you rotate between a, a fixed rotation of Caesar ciphers for each character, um, which is a little bit harder to crack. But you can, if you have a large enough text, you can still do letter frequency analysis um, because you, it, you can guess at how long the key is and you, or you can just like make guesses and then you're like, okay, this has like an English language letter frequency. Now we know what it says. Um, it's good for kids. I literally did a Caesar cipher with my son in nice. Python last week. Oh, awesome. Was, yeah. Like, teaching him some Python stuff. And yeah. Like, it's, it is a so great coding, coding exercise. I got really jazzed about it to see like this little. Nice. We both did the encryption and decryption part and it was like, his that, face kind of lit up. Like, oh, there's my message. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So modern symmetric encryption, um, we're gonna use this diagram on this slide and the next slide. So what we have is a block cipher. A block cipher operates on a fixed number of bits and it's coming in the top and then it goes through this encryption box and comes out the bottom and you use a key to change it. This is called ECB mode right now, what you are seeing. So if, you, if your plain text is longer than the number of bits that your cipher supports, you just chunk it up like this. So if, if, you, were, if you broke it up into three chunks, it would, look like it would look exactly like this. And this is called ECB mode. This is um, electronic code book mode. Um, and that is because it's actually named for a code book that was used like in World War II by spies. Um, and you would have a book of things that translated into other things. So you'd be like, I want to send a message that says this. Um, so you'd like flip through the index to the thing you wanted to send. And you would, and if it's longer than what you want to send, you, you know, you chunk it up. So you say like, okay, I'll send the first chunk and then I'll look up the next part that I want to send and chunk, send that chunk. Um, 
And so like each key is like creating a new code book. It's like you have a, a completely different code book that's different for each key. The problem with this is if you want to send the same message, does the exact same block multiple times, it's going to produce the exact same ciphertext for, for a given key. Um, this can be really obvious, for example, if you're, if you're encrypting an executable, um, which can have like long runs of zeros in it as part of the compilation process. And then you're like, you know, somebody could look at this and be like, okay, like X bytes into it, I'm seeing like the same thing repeated over and over again. Um, and I can probably guess it's an executable. There's different kinds of problems like that that can arise. So here's a bunch of different modes that are, that are better than ECB. So the first is ECB, what I just showed you. And a better way to do it is um, CBC, cipher block chaining, where you take an initialization vector. So there are now three inputs into your cipher. <clears throat> you have a plain text, a key, and an IV. And the IV doesn't matter what it is, it just has to be also random. Um, and it doesn't matter if an attacker knows what your IV is, because the whole point is just that it's, it's not going to, uh, so each block is not going to produce the same value. So even if all of these plain texts are identical, you can see this is an XOR operation. So we're just basically just scrambling it. I'm not going to get into what XOR is. Um, it's a very simple binary operation. But you, you XOR the IV with the plain text and you get a scrambled version of the plain text that you can then immediately unscramble with the IV on decryption. <clears throat> but then for the next one, you don't use the IV, you use the ciphertext from the previous block as the IV for the next block. So you end up with something totally different. So even if all these plain texts are all 0000, zero, zero, zero they're all identical zeros or whatever, um, what's, what they're getting XORed with each time is different. And then there's just a bunch of different other ways. They all have different uh, strengths and weaknesses. Some are objectively better than others. Um, especially some of them allow simultaneous decryption, which is nice. There's like a counter mode where instead of using an IV, they'll, they'll like increment it in the counter in such a way. So that way you know how to decrypt block N. Um, whereas with the IV, I think you need to do it in order. So you, you can't parallelize this for a very large ciphertext. So there, there are other, some of them have really just practical advantages over other ones. But in terms of security, they're, I, I can't speak to that because I'm not a professional cryptographer, but they're all pretty good. Just don't use ECB. That's obviously strictly the worst way to do it. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about authentication. Okay. So a message authentication code, or a MAC, is it's also symmetric, just like encryption, only it doesn't encrypt. It lets you know that the person who holds this key really produced this message. So you would you'd usually use this in conjunction with encryption. So you'd encrypt, and then you would uh, MAC your encryption value, so you're saying like, hey, I'm Andrew and we have like, you know, I share a key with Matt and I send him a message and he can decrypt it, but then also he can, he can uh, authenticate that it really came from me because we also share, we share a pair of keys. We share an encrypting key and a macking key. So these go great together. Whereas if we just had an encrypting key, you would, so again, like somebody could scramble it up and then he would just try and decrypt it and be like, huh, I wonder why Andrew sent me a bunch of garbage. Um, and the operations here are called signing and verifying. <clears throat> so you sign a message with a key and it produces a tag, an authentication tag. Um, and you verify a tag by taking the message and the tag and the key and it will tell you true or false that the holder of this key really produced uh, this, this tag. So this is completely different from, from a hash where anybody can produce a hash of a message and you don't know who made it. You're just like, well, it's definitely the hash of that message. Um, this, it's, it's, yeah, it is 
um, keyed to the person who owns the key. So, let me see. It's not like ciphertext though, right? It's like it's just it's something extra. Right, so the tag is not ciphertext because that is what we would use to say like encryption. Um, I believe tags are uh, fixed size. So similar to a hash, it will reduce to a finite space. At least I think that is true. Yeah. Um, Mac tag. Is the tag in a Mac fixed size? Uh, a Mac is a type of function, that is true. Um, the elbow length is a property of the function, it's not consistent for all Macs, that's, that's fair. Um, Okay, no, that's fair. Uh, basically, a Mac is a function with the properties that I just described, and length is not a property of Macs in general. You would need to look at a particular at a particular scheme. So, actually, what about? It could be fixed for a certain scheme, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Uh, so, in H Mac, um, block sizes. 512. Let me look at this. Oh, Pat. Do, 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 do. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Duh. Of course, this is. Um, so I'm just looking at the algorithm for HMAC, which is a kind of Mac. And the you don't even need to look at the inside because you can look at the outermost function, which is a hash function. It just takes its capital H. It can be various functions. You can choose a function for what you're going to do as long as you and your partner agree on what it is. Um, but so HMAC is fundamentally a hash of something that's been mutated in ways that are cryptographically interesting. But it is, it is a hash, so it's always going to be fixed length. So that's not necessarily true for, I mean, you could technically have a, tagging, a, a MAC tagging system that didn't have fixed length. And that would not violate the guarantees of a MAC. All right. So yeah, message authentication codes. HMAC. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so apparently you can <laughs> pass in any kind of key. Um, I'll just paste all this in and we'll see what happens here. Oh, and then you can, yeah. Here, I'll just copy this. You missed the leading up. Oh, thank you. OK, so H is this H macker, which can eat. You can give it an update, because it it's a hash function. Um, I mean, it, it uses a hash function, so it can be updated in the same way as a hash. But what's actually going on inside the hash is much more, is cryptographically interesting in a way that provides integrity guarantees. Isn't there also HMAC? In the standard library somewhere, am I making that up? I thought you could. There might be. Um, I forget which module it is, but. Oh, so that's actually a, a great point. I would, um, yes. It indeed has an HMAC in Hashlib. the Python standard library. Hashlib is the one that's like where you want to, it's like a generic interface for a bunch of different kinds of hashes. Can we, like, what if we just like import? Yeah, that works too. So HMAC is is a built-in live module. In fact, you don't even need to get. If you just want authentication, you can do this. Um, so actually, funny story about why HMAC is probably in there. But I guarantee you, if I import AES, it's not going to be in here. Um, is Cryptography is heavily regulated in many countries. Um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the idea that cryptographic algorithms are munitions uh, from US history. Um, but yeah, you're not allowed to export them 
which is really kind of silly because everyone knows what they are. Um. <laughs> so there's, there's also hashlib, which is useful. Is that in the standard that's, library? or? It's in the standard library. It's for, but it doesn't have a, AES-256. It's like no. SHA-256. Okay, yeah, sure, sure. Sure, that'll give you a bunch of hashes and stuff. Yeah. Um, that is, that is nice to know. Um, so actually, I, I now really want to jump to a much later slide in my talk. That was a little bonus slide because it is very cool. Um, it is this concept called winnowing and chafing. It's actually the very last slide of this. Um, so in some parts of the world, encryption is illegal or encryption above a certain size is illegal, which actually makes a huge logistical headache for trying to make the internet work. It's such a pain. Like, it was already a pain of like, you know, there's already a bajillion ways of doing encryption, but like, we can't even agree on, like, even if we agree on this way is the best, like, here are the best three ways to do this, then a bunch of world governments will be like, okay, cool, we got our list of three ways you're not allowed to do encryption. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this is a really interesting hack to work around the fact that encryption is illegal in a lot of contexts. And it is that you can use authentication to authenticate bits. And you can, and because HMAC is a, you can't know if an HMAC is valid unless you also hold the key. You can't generate a valid HMAC if you have the key, and you can't know if it's valid if you don't have the key. So what you can do is take a bit, take one bit at a time. If you want to send a bit to your friend, you can send them a bit and then either send them a valid or invalid MAC based on the macking key that you share. And then they, if it's valid, then the bit is true. And if it's invalid, then the bit needs to be flipped or whatever. Or just, or just don't send them bits. Just send them either a series of Macs that are either valid or invalid. And they're like, okay, one, zero, one, zero. This is true, this is false, this is true, this is false. So this is a way to communicate a bit string uh, in a way that is cryptographically secure when you don't have access to encryption. Yeah, so that's cool. Um, one major downside is there's, you can't do this in an asymmetric way, um, but it's, it's nice for building a symmetric crypto system out of a symmetric authentication system. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so here we go. Now we're going to get to the really cool stuff. All right. So cool. Any two people who have a previously shared secret can communicate messages. That's great um, for when you have time to drive to all your friends' houses and give them a key in person. Um, I, one of the problems is you have to then have a key for, you have to perform a key exchange with every single person that you want to talk to and you have to do it in a way that's secure and it's very difficult to bootstrap. Um, so Asymmetric crypto solves a ton of those problems, or at least gives us the tools to even begin solving those problems. Um, so the, like, the thing that really blew my mind, like I imagine most of you already know this because you do stuff with computers, but like when I learned this you know, years and years and years ago, it really blew my mind um, that you have two keys and imagine you have a lockbox and one of the keys can lock the lockbox, but can't open it, and the other key can open it, then you could just give everyone in the world a copy of the thing that locks your lockbox, and you could just leave a lockbox out on your porch, and if someone wanted to give you a secret message, they could just put it in, lock it, nobody else in the world can open it again, except for you, when you go and check it later. So that is exactly what asymmetric crypto is. So you generate the keys in pairs, and you, whereas with symmetric encryption, we only had one key that was shared between two people. You now have, each person has two keys, but only one of them gets shared and you can share it freely. Like, you know, with symmetric en encryption, the key is the secret because you also hold it. You have to make sure that only the people that you wanna have, have it, you have to be really secure with it and you have to give it to them, which is a very difficult set of criteria to meet. So 
asymmetric encryption says the thing that you have to give to other people, anybody can have it. Everybody should have it. It would be great. The more people that have it, the better. So the public key lets people encrypt. And then your private key that you give to no one lets you decrypt. OK, so we'll look at asymmetric, which I believe I put in red here. No, I put in blue here. Uh, no, apparently I've just used both of these for completely unrelated things. OK, let's just pull up RSA again. OK, so first thing you're going to want to do is do your import. No, not key loading. OK, so we're going to import RSA. RSA is far and away the most famous and I think first asymmetric crypto system ever published. Um, humorously enough, I believe like both the NSA and the British government's version of the NSA invented asymmetric crypto before academics published it. Um, they, they both figured this out and they're like, oh, that's cool. We're going to do this. Um, and then they published it and then they were like, oh, by the way, we've had that for a couple of years. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So we have this. So it says generate private key. Um, that's a little misleading because you're actually generating a key pair. Um, I believe you can derive the public key from the private key in RSA. I'm not, it's been a long time since I actually looked at the math there, so don't hold me to that. But I believe you can say, so we have private key. Cool, so this is our private key object. I think we can get private bytes, and then we need to like, oh, no, I need to do like a whole serialization thing. Um, Okay. Here, I know what I can do. I can say get public key, I think. So, public key. No, has no attribute get public key. What is it called? Oh, it's just called public key. There's no get. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so we have our public key and our private key. So we've just generated. Uh, you need to pass in these arguments. Um, really, if you are doing this, just read the documentation about what you're supposed to do. Um, it says you should choose a public exponent that is at least 65537. Um, just do that. <laughs> um, key size, most people, like kind of the state of the art is uh, 2048. Keeps getting bigger. We keep getting better at guessing a bunch of keys at once. Yeah, so I'll just talk also generally about key size. Like, um, one of the problems with cryptography is if you can just guess all the keys at once, then you can figure out what it is because you, you generally know kind of what the key size is based on the message. Um, and it, it's just a matter of guessing all of the keys to crack it. So any guarantees we have about security are kind of a function of how many guesses can an attacker make um, per second, and then how big is your key, and then you know have that because on average they're going to get they're going to find the key at least halfway through. Um, Makes you wonder how much stuff today that exists is now vulnerable that was yeah. vulnerable at the time it was created and was like a reasonable thing to do. But it's just like, well, we've got massive clusters of GPUs now. <laughs> yep. Fun. Actually, that, that really did happen. Um, there, before we had AES, we had something called DES encryption. And that is just broken now. Um, not only because of key size, but because the algorithm was just like, people found shortcuts through this algorithm. So it's, you know, it was like, oh, we have to oh, we'll cycle through this like a thousand times. And it was like, okay, well, uh, we figured out a way where, you know, if you get, 
you know, some output blah on cycle 47, then we know that cycle like 900 is going to be this, so we can just go ahead and skip a bit. Um, <laughs> so they figured out some, some major holes of, of that sort. And so that's why we don't use DES anymore. Uh, DES, if you are stuck using DES, uh, there is a way to use it called triple DES, which is not just using the algorithm like three times. I believe you use a decrypt process with a separate key, and then you encrypt it again. So it's actually like an encrypt, decrypt with a different key, and then encrypt it again, and then uh, and that's for whatever reason much harder to break. Uh, but that's there's gotta be so much data out there that's just like oh yeah, exposed there's and there's probably a lot of DES encrypted data out there. There will probably be a lot of AES encrypted data out there, you know, decades from now that is now just readable. Yep, keeping secrets is, is hard. Keeping, se keeping secrets in public is even harder. Okay, so we have our public key. So I'll just, uh, you can also serialize it um, using PEM. You have probably seen these in people's emails and stuff. Um, PEM is a serialization format for a key. So we can, we can output a PEM right here. That's what our private, I think that's what our private key looks like. Our public key is much smaller. Um, oh, actually, no, that's, sorry, I'm sorry. Probably the reason that's so big is because it is encrypted. What happens if we do it with no encryption? It's still pretty big. It's a little bit smaller, um, but that's you can you can encrypt it with a passphrase, as as you probably know if you have actually used a uh, SSH without a password. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you've probably done these. Okay, so I'm I'm running out of time here, so I, I do want to wrap this up and be timely. Um, so signing is the same thing in reverse. So let me go back to my slides real quick. And Okay, actually, before I get to signing, I want to talk about hybrid encryption. So encrypting stuff with, a, with an asymmetric scheme. Asymmetric schemes can actually only operate on very small amounts of data compared to uh, how symmetric keys work. So usually what you actually do in practice um, and I'll, like virtually any crypto library will do under the hood for you automatically is random is produce a random symmetric key and encrypt that instead of your message. So it will encrypt your message symmetrically and then it will encrypt the symmetric key using the public key. So you are you're like both of these things are inside of locked boxes, but here's the much bigger message that's being locked by this green key that's then being put inside of this much smaller box that's being locked by this red public key. So this is called hybrid encryption. It's where we are leveraging the advantages of both systems. The symmetric key, the symmetric system is ability to encrypt large amounts of data very quickly and the uh, asymmetric systems ability to, you know, broadcast keys freely. <clears throat> All right, digital signatures. Okay, this is also super important. So if you want to post a message and prove that it really came from you, you can, um, it's just, a signature, by the way, I've always found to be kind of a silly name because signatures are, like wet signatures are not really super great at verifying identities. I mean, it's okay if you're like a handwriting analyst, but like even so, they're pretty like, they're like, oh, it's, that's a pretty crappy signature. Like maybe they were just in a hurry or they're a doctor or whatever. Like, and it's just, <laughs> um, <laughs> so digital signatures are a way, uh, similar to Max, you can, uh, but, but in an asymmetric way, you can use your private key to produce a signature and then you can, Ver anyone in the world can verify that that really was produced by you. Um, now, it can't actually verify that it was by you, the human person, but it, we can know that the owner of this key pair produced it or the holder of the private key. 
And you could then also verify statements like, hey, by the way, I'm Andrew Sillers, and then sign that. And you're like, okay, whoever signed this really wanted me to believe that the owner of this key is Andrew Sillers. Might be him. Um, so actually, that is the end. So I can just show a quick code example. And so also, signatures are super important because they form the backbone of, and I'm missing the leading F here. They form the backbone of PKI systems, which is like proving who anybody is. Um, that's how you do like key signing parties, you know, so you can like, if you, if somebody says like, Hey, I have this key. Is it really from Andrew Sillers? Um, they can look in a, a database or in a distributed set of databases. In fact, it doesn't have to be, anyone can host a copy of this. It's great because it's just, uh, it's just a signature and there's nothing private about it. Um, but only the person who holds a private key could create it. And it, it could just be a bunch of statements that are like, hey, I'm, I'm Matt and this really is Andrew's key. There's a, you know, a particular format for encoding this in a machine readable way, but you can just, you can make statements um, about the identity of a key holder and then sign it. And then you're like, well, okay, whoever owned this key really believed that because they, they just produced, they used their private key to produce it, to make a statement to this effect. And then we can look at the owner of that key and they also have a bunch of other people who are vouching for them that that's really who they are. So I know that A really believes that, you know, B's key is this. Um, and then a bunch of people believe stuff about them. So that's how key signing parties work, is you actually meet up in person and you verify each other's IDs, like with driver's licenses and stuff, and then you sign their keys. And then you just have a whole bunch of uh, assertions about the attachment here of your identity to your, uh, to your public key. They do this for like popular Linux distribu distributions like Debian, I think. Or but, at least they used to. Yeah, they'll have key signing. Like, I've seen pictures of it. Like, they'll just have, like, giant cafeteria tables, and they'll just, like, boop, 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 like, speed dating, except instead of dating, you <laughs> sign each other's yeah. keys. <laughs> the, the idea there is, like, at least in the Debian case, it was, um, we need to trust each other's, like, packages and uploads. And stuff. Oh, so yeah. This web of trust. Right, right, right. the Debian developers. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Verify Right. Whatever has gone into has been like confirmed by a group of people that have met in your life and maintained their keys. And yep. It's that makes sense. To maintain that, but that's something that it, at least they used to do. I, I don't know if they still do it, but for a long time that's what they did. Yeah. So here we go. Here's a message I want to sign. So yeah, I can just say like. And then we'll make it. Um, and this also uses a hash internally. Uh, similar to the, to the hybrid encryption, um, signatures also use a hybrid approach, but instead of using a symmetric key, they just will hash it. They'll just take the statement, reduce it down with a hash, um, which is interesting because actually then you're also technically signing every other hash input that hashes to that value, but most of those are not interesting. Although there's an infinite number of them, so who knows. Um, and I think this is our signature. Boom. Now we have a bunch of bytes and we can serialize that out to disk. We can give that to whoever we want and then they can verify it. Um, verification, public key, is that? Oh, this didn't actually produce an answer. Oh, it will, it will, it actually will raise an exception if it's, so. So it's inaction produced an answer, I guess. I believe it did, yes. Um, so if I instead say, I guess I would just say, oop, oop, nope. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay. Wrong signature. Uh, 
and then I put everything else in the same, it should produce an error. Oh, it's actually producing an error because I didn't give it a byte. <laughs> I didn't give it a string of bytes. It's angry about that. Uh, <laughs> let me let me see if I can get this to actually. Demos. Hmm. Demos. Yeah, there we go. I get invalid signature. So I tried giving it anything else, and it says this is not a valid signature for this message. Also, if I change the message, it would, you know, if I had said like I'm Bob, it'd be like this is not a signature for this for an assertion that you're Bob. So also, the cool thing is a lot of crypto standards are about how to declare these kinds of assertions. So like HTTPS, uh, you know, TLS is built on the uh, X509 uh, standard, which they also have recipes for. And uh, X509s are used for code signing, they're used for uh, TLS, they're used for probably other stuff that I can't think of right now. But it's like, it's a way of describing an entity. I mean, there's, there's a lot of parts of it, but part of it is how to describe an entity. So for example, when we create this uh, signature signing request, I'm not gonna get into what this is, but if you've, if you've ever set up TLS or like a self-signed TLS or whatever, you say all this stuff. You're like, hey, I'm from this country, this state, this locality, this organization, common name. Uh, I'm gonna add alternate names that are a DNS name. So I basically am supplying all this information and then a certificate authority, some globally trusted organization who everyone knows really, you know, as a, as a matter of a, a priori fact, really is, you know, VeriSign's keys really are these, and we all know that because they're in Microsoft Windows or whatever, um, will then sign this. Like you, you create this kind of assertion using this X509 standard, and then you provide proof of identity to VeriSign and then VeriSign will sign it. They'll say, yes, we really do think this is true. Um, and that's basically how all security works on the internet. And you don't need to have this to have secure communication, but you do need to have it to know who you're talking to. So you can have secure communication, like, you know, if some dude comes up to you in a trench coat in an alley and starts whispering to you, you know, you're having a secure communication with him, but you don't know who he is. Especially if he says like, hey, I'm your friend, like, I'm, I'm you know, I'm your bud, Bob, you know me. And you're like, can you take your head off? And he's like, nah, I can't. Um, <laughs> uh, then you're like, I'm not sure I was talking to Bob. Like, I don't think anybody overheard me in this conversation, but I'm not 100% sure the person I just had a conversation with was my friend Bob. Um, so this is a way of making assertions about associating identity with these public keys so that we really have some, some way of making, of, of, of declaring some kind of trust. You know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's way better than, we do. Yeah, so that kind of sucks. Um, that's why, so there can also be distributed PKI infrastructures. Um, but yeah, right now, how a lot of the inf internet works, a lot of TLS works is we give all the certificate authorities the power. And that can be a really big problem because they can be run by nation states. Uh, like, you know, was it, was it Iran or something that was like, oh, by the way, uh, we've been issuing fake certificates like for Google or whatever, and Google was not happy about that. Uh, <laughs> we said that the Iranian government ran Google um, so then they could snoop on everybody's stuff. So yeah, so that's, it, it's hard to do distributed trust. You know, it's hard to trust. Um, it's hard to place trust because and there's even a bunch of certificate authorities like we have it you know kind of distributed but you only need one point of trust to get your system to say okay yeah it looks good uh, but so there are lots of other alternate proposals where you get kind of a fuzzy idea of like well a lot of people are saying that this that this is a match so probably it is hmm. I, so I think the reason why this works in like you're doing it in Python, like you get the request library, what, how, how, do you, how can you connect to anything? And if you go look at the dependencies of what requests will 
installed uh -huh. as one of its dependencies. I, I believe one of them is certify, which I think it holds the certificate chain. So that is oh, yeah. all this like trust <coughs> network. Yep. Yep. So that you can actually check the, the data for what's current. Yes. Yeah, and uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of the things they run is the uh, um, let me make sure I don't get the wrong the name wrong. Um, the SSL Observatory. They have downloaded data sets of all publicly visible SSL certificates on the IPv4 internet in order to search for vulnerabilities, document practices of certificate authorities, and aid researchers interested in the web's encryption infrastructure. So EFF, one of the many things they do is like are a watchdog for weird certificate authority behavior. But it can still happen. I mean, like, like Iran did it. I'm, I'm, I hope, hope I'm not slandering Iran here. Um, was it certificate? Yeah. Yep, that, that's, that's them. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure they have an issue of fraudulent certificates header, and they do. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that was what happened. So yeah, it's it's a big problem. It's hard to solve. Like trust is is hard to solve in general. We have picked one approach, <laughs> and this is up. Um, actually, I'll talk about two more things real quick, and then I'm done. Just two little bonus slides. Um, one is so I've talked a lot about security. It turns out you can actually have perfect uh, confidentiality really, really easily, which is you share a one-time pad with your partner and basically it just says like imagine you're a general and you're like okay I'm going to need to send you a message that either says attack or retreat and I'm going to I'm going to send you this message however I want to make sure the enemy who is also going to hear me broadcast this message doesn't know so beforehand we will agree on whether I'm going to lie or not randomly I'm going to flip a coin and if it's heads, I'll lie to you about what to do. And if it's tails, I'll tell you the truth about what to do. And so you do that, you agree on whether or not you're gonna lie, then you go out into battle, and then the next day I say retreat. And then the enemy doesn't know whether I'm telling the truth or not because I randomly decided in a coordinated way about whether I'm gonna lie. So that's what you do for a whole bunch of bits. You just, your pad is just, this bit is true, this bit is false, this bit is true, this bit is false, this bit's true, 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 false, um, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's perfectly secure because there's no way to know whether any particular bit is true or not because at random we decided whether or not it would be a lie. Um, that's the Byzantine general's problem, is that right? Oh no, that's, that's completely, well, I think that's a different problem. You might be thinking of the two generals who are trying to coordinate about whether to attack at the same time. That is, that is an unsolvable problem in information. It's systems problem, I think, with the Byzantine generals. Oh, okay. It sounds a lot like what I think that's an... Yeah, but the solution is not what we're actually... No, I, I think that's an unsolvable informatics problem, yeah. if I'm thinking of the right thing. Um, this is not an unsolvable informatics problem. This is a actually eminently solvable informatics problem. <laughs> so this is perfect. It is perfect security. There is no way to crack it. There is no way to, to get around it. Um, the only problem is you run out of bits. So you have to, so the thing is, this actually is used in the real world. And like, because it's great, it's awesome. There is no way to break it. Um, and so people, will, companies will, governments will invest in the physical distribution of key material to go drive it somewhere, you know, with some dude with a whole bunch of hard drives, like, you know, handcuffed onto his arm and uh, deliver a bunch of key material so they can continue to have perfectly secure communication, which is very cool. It reminds me of the, the one time, I'm sorry, the, uh, the number stations on HF radio. Oh, yeah. Like number stations could actually be using this possibly. It's like, and you would never be able to figure out what it means because you don't have the key. But it's just and plain. Yep. Exactly. Yep. I think spies just use one time, and they probably still do. For all I know, one time. 
and had one. Yeah, I mean, it's great. It's, it's great. They still use it. Like, it's probably never going to go out of style. Like, there is always going to be, you know, it's not good for every use case, but there are probably always going to continue to be cases where it's valuable. Hey, Joe, if you're next time we go to dinner, you can bring this back to Minecraft somehow. <laughs> <laughs> you bring this to Minecraft? Yes. I'll think about it. <laughs> oh, actually, my brother, who is an electrical engineer, um, once independently invented a flip flop. He was like, oh, check it out. I send an electrical pulse and then it like flips this thing. And I was like, this is a flip flop. Like, I just learned about this a couple years ago in my in my comp e class. And he was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Uh, last. Thing I'll talk about is homomorphic encryption. Um, that's super cool because you can do math over ciphertext. Like it's bananas, it's so cool. You can take two pieces of ciphertext that you have no idea what they mean and you can do some mathematical operation and then give the result of that operation to the holder of the key and they can decrypt it and learn what you did, learn the result of that operation. So one way that this manifests is actually in RSA. So RSA, if you're gonna use it properly, you can't do this, but in textbook RSA, which is much more vulnerable, uh, but, gener but like explains the general principle, um, it's just an exponent. Um, you know, this message is raised to an exponent and then you do a, a, a mod on it. Um, but so this encrypted value is ultimately an exponent, which means you can uh, make it interact in certain multipl multiplicative ways with other uh, messages that are also encrypted in the same way. So if you yeah, um, well, this is a lot of math, but anyway. You, Basically, you can multiply it, and then it like adds stuff together. Because multiplication with exponentiation can add things together. Um, that's how you can do it. Uh, in, in many cases, this is not a desirable property to have, because you can actually produce then valid ciphertexts. Uh, so we take steps to make it so you can't do that when you're actually using RSA for non-homomorphic purposes. <laughs> do you have any sense? I don't have a good sense on a use case for like, what would you use this? Okay, for? oh man, love the use cases for this. Okay, so one is you, okay, one is kind of far-fetched, but we're getting there, um, is you could outsource your computations to other people that you don't trust. Like, I mean, like, do you remember like when protein folding was huge? And then I think we got like, AI to solve protein folding. Um, but like people would put protein folding programs on their computer and just run them. Right. Um, you could do that, but instead of protein folding, you could be doing anything. And so we actually now have fully homomorphic encryption as of like 10 years ago. Um, so that means you can run a Turing machine in ciphertext. So you can do anything a Turing machine can do in a way that you have no idea what it is that you're doing. You can just be given instructions saying like, multiply these together, sum them all up, you know, divide by this, whatever, give me back the answer. So you could just go throw a bunch of numbers at a bunch of random computers and get back answers and then decrypt them. So this isn't really practical right now because it's just super expensive. It's like, why not just, if you could do this, why not just, do it yourself. Um, but there are certain cases where it's valuable. Um, one case, okay, one use case that is way cooler than what I just talked about is verifiable elections. So what you can do is you can publish a homomorphic transformation of everyone's vote in a way that you cannot tell uh, so how it works basically is you publish all the votes. So imagine just like a simple yes, no election. There's only a single question. 
Um, and you are basically, when you leave your polling place, you're given like an identifier. So I mean, actually for a yes, no, it's actually, you could just, you could just have a, a counter or whatever. But the much cooler use case is you can publish homomorphic transformations of everyone's ballots and then add them together and say, here is the winner of the election. And then each individual participant in the election can use a cryptographic means to verify that their vote is in there. So you can just, so you can't really verify anybody else's vote, which is a feature because you don't want to know if somebody else voted. Um, that's, that's a privacy concern. So you can look at the, the public election data set and say, yes, my vote is in here. It is clear and it is reflective of the way that I actually voted. Um, and we can use homomorphic addition to sum up all of the votes and get a verifiable total. So that's pretty cool. Assuming there are 100% participation. Yeah. So then there's the problem of like you could you could slip you could slip extra votes in. Yeah, I suppose you could. Yes, that is true. Voting is, hard. Voting is an extremely hard problem. It's a really weird intersection of like you should definitely not be able to do this, and you should definitely be able to do this. Maybe you should be able to cancel your vote after the fact, or maybe you shouldn't be able to cancel your vote after the fact. What if someone coerced you into doing that? You know, like maybe you shouldn't be able to vote in your house because somebody could coerce you. So maybe you should go into a polling place where nobody can see what you're doing. You know, people shouldn't know if you voted or not at all. Um, there's, there's a lot of constraints. It is a whole other academic discipline. <clears throat> but there are several applications of homomorphic crypto uh, that are of great interest in election theory. That's probably the most interesting use case for it. Um, that's it. All right. Thanks for coming to my talk. Hope you enjoyed it. No. No. Nope. Um, I actually did work on a on a prototype um, that was like queryable encryption uh, that MongoDB is now like solving in a cool way. Um, like I wasn't involved in that research. I'm I'm just saying like this is something that is now coming to like commercial fruition. I I worked on it a few years ago before there were any like real good commercial implementations of this, and now that field is, is growing. I'm off, I've been off it for a few years. Um, but now I went and got my degree in security informatics, and I don't really do security anymore, uh, which is fine, because I honestly find it very stressful. I'd rather just make computers do so. I make computers crunch statistics, so. <laughs> but but it is, it's, it's fun. Um, it's fun just knowing about this. It's also fun like knowing, like my employer does um, a man in the middle, like transformation on SSL, and like I have had other coworkers uh, either being like I don't understand how they can do this, or I don't understand why my pipeline is breaking because of this. So in all of those cases, I'm like, what you need to do is add it so that security so the certificate is trusted because they have made their own certificate and they're replacing the keys with their own keys. I don't know. Like I'm able to just explain this to them in a robust way and answer their questions because I'm like, yeah, I know all these primitives. Like I totally understand exactly what's going on. Like it's nothing that I actually should need to know because you know, nothing should break, but stuff breaks all the time because of this. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, I imagine I'm not revealing much by saying that this exists because this is a, a pretty widespread uh, employer technique. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you.